Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Hmm. Because of time, let's, I'll be making reference to the remaining of the chapter in due course. But let's just take the reading from verse 19. A little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Come on, somebody say, at that day, I will know. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he, it, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the fathers who sent me. Yeah. These things I have spoken to you. Why being present with you? But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. Acceleration by power. Heavenly Father, we receive your blessing on the ministry of your holy word. As I teach this morning, I ask you to enlighten our darkness. I ask the precious Lord that you will cause the illumination of your Holy Spirit to be ours today, ushering us into a deeper walk with you and ushering us into new dimensions of power that we have never known. Thank you, Lord, because you will sure do it and you will do exceeding abundantly above what we ask or think in Jesus' name. And somebody says, Amen. Amen. When we look into scripture, we will discover various manifestations of the presence of God. The first one that we will realize is the sovereign presence of God. God is everywhere at all times. He is in every good place. He is in every bad place. He is in every suitable place. He is in every unsuitable place. The entirety of the universe is in God. So God is everywhere. Secondly, we will also see it that there is God's indwelling presence, which is the privilege we have in the New Testament. In John 14, if you read earlier in this same chapter, the Lord Jesus Christ said in verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. In verse 16, he said, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot see, uh, whom the world does not know, rather, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So by the Holy Spirit coming to dwell inside you and I, we have the indwelling presence of God. So we have God's sovereign presence. We have God's indwelling presence. But there is a third one, and that is the manifest presence of God. When we talk about the manifest presence of God, we are talking about the active presence of God. God can be in a person. God can be around a person, but not be active in that person's life. And I can illustrate it with when we talk about um, potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy is stored energy. Kinetic energy is active or released energy. While God is everywhere, God is not active in every place. The manifest presence of God is God's active presence. It is God's visible presence. It is God's revealed presence. And it is God's demonstrative presence. I go over them again. God's active presence. God's visible presence. God's 
revealed presence and God's demonstrative presence. So, when God's presence is activated, when it is visible, when it is revealed, when it is demonstrative, then we see the power of God in operation. The presence of God, when manifested, releases his power. It releases his anointing. It releases God's grace in action. And we will discover that when God's presence is a manifestation, there is divine acceleration. And whatever you do, you will see divine acceleration. Things will happen faster than you can imagine. One of the reasons why we need, the, why we need divine acceleration is because of stagnation. Divine acceleration breaks the hold of stagnation. It has never been the will of God that your life should stagnate. God always wants progress, forward movement, advancement. Deuteronomy 2, 3, he told Moses, you have circled this mountain long enough. Turn you not words. God expected that there should be growth. In our spiritual lives, God does not want, want us stagnant. That's why in 1 Peter 2, 2, Peter said, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. God wants you growing. God wants you advancing. God wants you making progress. 2 Peter 3, 18 says, but growing grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Growing grace. God wants you to grow in grace. In the same vein, God wants you to advance in God's purpose for your life. God wants you to move forward. Like Isaac, who in Genesis 26 verse 14, the Bible says that Isaac waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. So, divine acceleration breaks the hold of stagnation. Number two, divine acceleration reverses regression. There are times when some lives are not only stuck, but they have moved back. Paul made it very clear in Acts chapter 10, verse 35. He said, cast not therefore away your confidence, which has a great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, so that after ye have done the will of God, ye may obtain the promise. And then he now said, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. He said, don't draw back. If anybody draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Don't regress. Don't put this vehicle in reverse. Spiritually, don't go back to your vomit. The things you've left before, don't go back to them. Don't go back to where you are on your journey with God before. Don't reinvent the wheel. Move forward. Make progress. Advance. Conquer new grounds. Paul said in Philippians uh, 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 you know, 3.13, not that I've already attained, but this one thing I do. Uh, he said, forgetting the things which are behind, I press forward toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3.14 now. Praise God. I press. Somebody say, I press. I make effort. I push towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So divine acceleration reverses regression or reverses retrogression. And if you've been moving backwards, I see God reversing it today. I see God reversing it today in the name of Jesus. Number three reason why we need divine acceleration is that we might come up to speed. So that there might be restoration bringing us up to speed with God. In Joel 2.25, God said, I will restore the year that the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the caterpillar. He said that the year that the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and, and the palmer worm, my great army which I send among you. Uh, you know, he said, I'm going to restore the years that they have eaten. God says, I'm going to restore time back to you. 
God says, I can, I can bring you up to speed with me. Glory to God. And when God brings you up to speed, everything begins to work together for good again. Our God is a God of divine acceleration. He can turn around the hand of the time. He can move it forward very rapidly. And he can cause you to find yourself up to speed again. There is such a thing as catching up spiritually. <laughs> Glory to God. I see you catching up spiritually. In the name of Jesus Christ. It was like Elijah. First Kings 18. Out of running the chariot of Ahab. And that is the fourth thing divine acceleration can do. A divine acceleration can put you forward. Divine acceleration can put you ahead. We know according to the word of God that God's plan is for you to be the head and not the tail, to be above and not beneath. According to Psalm 74, 5 and 6, promotion comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. God is the judge of all. He puts down one and he sets up another. And so God can put you forward. God can put you ahead of the pack. God can put you in front of everybody else. Glory be to God. Now, I want to show you something in John chapter 6. That's a very interesting story that I love very much in John chapter 6. The Lord Jesus Christ had just finished performing the miracle of feeding 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. He now asked his disciples to go to the other side, to cross to the other side. And while the guys were making the journey to the other side, they began to, to experience a storm on the way. And the Lord Jesus decided to uh, go and, 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 and meet them on the way on the journey. And the Bible tells us that as soon as he entered into the boat with them, suddenly... They just found themselves on the shore. That is divine acceleration. Give me a minute to get you uh, that particular uh, reference. Glory to God. That's John chapter 6. Look with me at verse 21. John chapter 6 and look at uh, the 21st verse. And the word of the Lord declares uh, there... Let me just read from the 20th verse here. The Bible says, uh, uh, let me read. But he said to them, because when he was coming, they thought he was a ghost. And they were scared. Uh, especially when you read the, the Luke account of it. It tells it in more details. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat. Hallelujah. This is the presence of Jesus coming into the boat of your life, coming into the boat of your career, coming into the boat of your ministry, coming into the boat of your business. Hallelujah. The willingly received him into the boat and immediately, somebody say immediately, the boat was at the land where they were going. <laughs> Glory to God. All lost time was recovered. All the regression was recovered. They had been rowing. The storm had been beating against them. It had been moving their boat in the wrong direction. But thank God they held on to the journey. And they refused to give up in the midst of the storm. And all they needed was the presence of Jesus. The woman Jesus stepped into the boat. They found themselves on the shore. <laughs> so don't worry about your setbacks. Don't worry about the delays. Don't worry about the challenges. Don't worry about the stumbling blocks across your way. Once the manifest presence of Jesus steps into the situation, you will find yourself at the shore. You will succeed at the last. You will break through at the last. You will testify at the last. All things will work together for your good at the last. Let me hear a very big amen. amen. Now let's go back to our text in John chapter 14. Uh, and we've established the fact that the presence of Jesus is what makes all the difference. It is the manifest presence of God. Now, in John chapter 14, you will see the Lord Jesus make a statement. Uh, what he was encouraging the disciples and 
In encouraging them, he wanted them to realize his oneness with his father. And the reason why he wanted them to realize his oneness with his father was so that they will know exactly what the will of the father is for them. The kind of relationship the father wanted them to have. And this is the kind of relationship that if we have it with the father, we'll be operating super supernaturally. We will be up operating by the power of God and we will see things accelerating by the anointing. You will find yourself at the right place at the right time, accomplishing the right things at the right time. You will find yourself unstoppable on your journey. Yeah. Now, he told Philip. Philip says, show us the father. Uh, in, in John chapter 14, look, at, look with me at verse 6. Jesus said, uh, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, verse 7, you will have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Uh -huh. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long? And yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. <laughs> look at, let's look at this verse in details. Don't you believe that I am in my Father and my Father is in me? Look at the oneness there between the Lord Jesus and his Father. And this oneness translated into oneness in spirit, oneness in thoughts, oneness in feelings, oneness in speech, oneness in performance. Even though Jesus had his humanity, his humanity was clothed in divinity because he was God in the flesh. Oneness with the Father. So he was like, look, don't you understand the oneness? He went ahead to explain it to Philip. He said in verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or I ask, believe me for the sake of the works themselves. In other words, when you see my performance, let my supernatural performance convince you that the Father is in me. This is not ordinary here. Now, what is the relevance of Jesus making this particular statement? Because you might say, oh, that was very true about Jesus. But hang in there. In verse 12, he now said, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than this, he will do because I go to my father. Now, he just said, look here. My father and I are one. I am in my father. And my father in me. If you don't believe for any reason, believe me for the sake of the works. He now said, if you believe in me, the same works that I do, which actually was the father in him doing them, you also will do and even greater works than this you will do because I go to my father. What Jesus was simply saying was this. As I am in my father and my father is in me, so will you be in the father and the father will be in you also. Are you following somebody? This supernatural Jesus was saying you will become supernatural people. Whoever truly believes in me will become supernatural. Whoever truly believes in me will become anointed. Whoever truly believes in me will carry God as I carry God. The whoever truly believes in me will become powerful like I am powerful. Whoever truly believes in me, I will come into him together with my father. It will be a oneness with us. The person will become united with us in spirit, united with us in soul, united with us even in his body. 
His performance will not be a natural performance anymore. It will be a supernatural performance. Glory be to God. That's why he said, he that believes in me, who believes in me, the works that I do will he do also, and greater works than this he will do, because I go to my father. What's the relevance of that? I'll come back to our text. He explains it further in the text. But in chapter 16, there's an explanation. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So when he said, I am going away, the advantage is that the spirit of the father that was in him will now come to dwell in us. The same spirit of the father. You don't have another Holy Spirit apart from the one that Jesus had. The one Jesus had is the same one that is in the church today. Glory be to God. I said glory be to God. I said glory be to God. I stood across the table. I've told that story in this church before. I stood across the table from Ryan and Bunky. The late Ryan the Bunker, mightily used by God in, in, the, in Africa to uh, the preaching of the gospel and the mighty miracles. And, and I asked them, Dr. Bunker, tell me, why is it that 70 blind people can see in a single crusade on a night in Africa in your ministry? What is the key to the greater miracles of God? What is the fasting? What is the sacrifice? What is the price that there is to pay? Dr. Bunker looked at me and said, Victor, Victor, it is nothing but faith. It is nothing but faith. If you will believe God, you will see the greater miracles of God. If you will believe God, you will see the greater miracles of God. <laughs> if only we will realize our oneness with him, we will realize and be conscious of his presence in us. If only we will take our eyes off ourselves and put it on him and realize his presence in us, then our faith will rise and our faith will cause his presence to be in greater manifestation. Because I looked at this verse one day, I said, Lord Jesus, when I look at the weakness of the church, when I look at the lack of power in the church, uh, it makes me question, did Jesus mean these words when he spoke them? When he said, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do. Even greater works than this, he will do. I mean, did he mean it? I said, if Jesus meant it, then what does it mean to believe in him. What does it mean to believe in him? And that is where the Lord broke it down for me. Glory to God. Number one. To believe in Jesus. Is to believe in his divinity. This Jesus. Is God. He's not an ordinary man. He is God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. John 1.1 1, 1 says, He is the mind of God. He is the revelation of the invisible God, the visible manifestation of the invisible God. The welcome man of God. He is the visible manifestation of who? The invisible God. He is God. Peter looked at him and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Matthew 16, 16. He said, Blessed art thou Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. God. You must believe he is 
God. Uh, number two, if you believe in him, you will believe in his incarnation. This word of God. According to John 1, 14, and the world, this eternal world by whom the entire universe was created was made flesh. <laughs> The beauty of the living in the fact that he was made flesh, was made a human being, is in coming into the realization that what he came to do was to show us true humanity as it was in the mind of God at the beginning. Yes. Because while as God he had unlimited power, as man, he had to set aside the full strength of his divinity in heaven and he had a human experience in the which he was absolutely dependent, dependent on the Holy Spirit. So that you and I today, having the same Holy Spirit he was dependent upon, can believe to operate at the level at which he operated. That's why he said, the works that I do, shall he do also. Yes. Number three, to believe in him is to believe in his great work of redemption. Yes. Believing in Jesus is to believe in the great work of redemption. That this sinless Jesus, this perfect Jesus... This incarnate God went to Calvary's cross as a substitute for you and I. The sinless was made a sinner that the sinners might be made sinless in him. Oh yeah, you didn't hear that. You've got to believe that he took our place before the father that we might take his place. Oh, yes. That is part of believing in Jesus. He who believes in me, the works that I do shall he do. You've got to believe the great work of redemption. That in the, the great work of redemption, he took all our sins and all the barrier that was between us and God out of the way. Glory to God. And through the great work of grace, he brought us complete forgiveness for our sins and then broke the power of death over us. Glory be to God. And everything he did, he did for us. He came for us. He died for us. He was buried for us. He went to hell for us. He now rose for us and then ascended for us and sat down at the right hand of the, right hand of the Father for us. Glory to God. If he did it for us, then that means there's a oneness between us and him today. Glory to God. He did everything for us. So, the final one, number four, is for you to now believe he is in us today. Colossians 1.27 the revelation of this great mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. <laughs> you see, as the Father was in him and he was in the Father, so now is he in us and we in him also. For 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 says, by one spirit I yield baptized into one body. So we are in that body of Christ. We are one with him and he is one with us. In the same way, Look at his words again in our text. In John chapter 14. And look at verse 19. A little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. Actually when he said because I live, literally in the Greek it says because I am alive, you will live also. You will live with the same life of mine. <laughs> The life we have right now is not ours. It's the Christ life. It is no longer I who live. It is Christ that lives in me. That's why Paul says, for to me to live is Christ. And then to die is gain. 
we just do not operate in faith in that life of Christ that is within us. If we operate in Christ consciousness, and there are several words in the New Testament that talks, talk about it, and at times we, we, we probably don't interpret them correctly. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Once we see that word everlasting, we just think, oh, what is about is that? Okay, when we die, we go to God in heaven. Listen to me. Yes, it is true that that life is everlasting in duration, but the word life there speaks of life as God has it in himself. Whoever believes in him will have the same life that he has got on the inside of him. What made Christ Christ is in you to make you Christ in him. It's a oneness with him. Glory to God. I was listening to a man of God. He said he had just gotten this revelation of the life of God one day and that he had a domestic accident and had a court. He said, I had this court. My, my flesh was a little bit removed. He said, I put my flesh back there. I said, heal in Jesus' name. He said, and instantly I was healed. Just by the revelation of life. <laughs> the late John G. Lake was so conscious of this life that in the days of the bubonic plague that was similar to Ebola, Himself and his associates were busy burying dead people because nobody wanted to bury dead people. If you come in contact with the saliva of a dead person, the throat of a dead person, or their bodily fluids, you catch the plague and you die quickly. So everybody, there were so many dead people littering the streets. He and his associates were busy burying the dead and they were not even wearing protective gear. Oh yeah, they were not wearing protective gears. So, some scientists from America went there to investigate what was happening. So, they took some of the fraud from the mouth of a dead person. And John G. Lake said, place it in my hand. Because he told them that there's a principle in the Bible called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He said, the life of Jesus flows through my body. He said, so, take the fraud. Put it on my on the palm of my hand. They did that and examined it under the microphone, mic microscope rather, and they discovered that once the germs touch the body of John G. Lake, they die. All because of the revelation of Christ in me, the life of God being in me, the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Believing in Jesus is believing he is God. Believing in Jesus is believing that he was incarnated. Believing in Jesus is believing in the great work of redemption. And believing in Jesus is believing that he dwells within us today. Hallelujah! That faith in the indwelling Christ will get his power into manifestation. Will get his presence into manifestation in our lives. And it will make a difference in everything we do. Your brain will work, ex will work extra supernaturally. In his book, Zoe, the God Kind of Life, the late Dr. Kennedy Hagen mentioned how that after he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ, because of the consciousness of the life of God, he began to make straight A's in school. Supernatural comprehension. Glory to God. I remember my older brother, he, 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 was, he, he resumed a college in Nigeria many years ago to study engineering. And he had problems with engineering mathematics. If I still remember very well, his first time, he got 20 something percent. That was how woefully he failed the course. And my brother went praying about it and asking the Lord what to do. And the Lord gave him what became keynote for his ministry? Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate day in day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written there, and for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. And he began to daily meditate on the word of God. This life can affect you. natural parents. You can be a supernatural actor, supernatural musician, supernatural. Whatever you do, you should be supernatural by the power of God. 
Your performance should be extraordinary. Should not be an ordinary person wherever you find yourself. Glory be to God. <laughs> the Lord Jesus, after he went to heaven, in Acts 4, 13, his disciples were preaching and preaching with boldness. The Bible says when they beheld the boldness of Peter and John, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, can you put it on the screen for me? Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Uh, glory to God. The Bible says, and they took knowledge. Acts 4, verse 13. Can I have it? Anybody in the media? Or asleep or something? Praise God. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, the Greek word is parhesia, speaks of the unfettered outspokenness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men they marvel. This boldness has to do with their articulation and erudition when they spoke. It included the intellectual prowess with which they expressed themselves and the level of wisdom with which they were talking. They were just amazed. They took knowledge that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. The same way that guy didn't go to school and yet he was speaking supernaturally. My mother is not literate in the English language. She was raised without education due to, due to a guardian denying her of education. She said whenever she was in church that she always felt very uncomfortable, not being able to sing hymns with everybody, nor read the Bible with everybody in church. And then she said she cried out to God, give me understanding, ability to read the, your word, the Bible. I want to be able to understand your word and sing songs to you. And bam, supernaturally it just happened one day. And she said she began to read the Yoruba Bible. And she began to, to sing the, 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 hymn, the hymnals. Supernaturally. So when I was a child, she taught me the language, how to read in the language. And yet nobody taught her. Supernaturally. She asked God to do it. As an evangelical woman. Young woman. Our God can touch our brains. His power is endless. There is nothing our God cannot do. We only need to be conscious of the Christ that is in us. It was not long ago I read the story of Tommy Titcomb, a Canadian missionary who took the gospel to my people in Nigeria. He was not a Pentecostal. He didn't speak in tongues. But he knew the word of God. And this guy went with the consciousness of Christ with him to preach the gospel to animists and idolaters. He said that my people were steeped in superstition and idolatry when they got there. Every single family had an idol that was dedicated to Satan, the worship of Satan. And I remember my dad told me that he grew up as a child to know that idol in front of the family house. It was dedicated to the worship of Satan. They had another one for the, the worship of God who they did not know. But all they just knew is that you have to respect both parties. <laughs> you, you have to worship one and the other one. You also have to worship him and appease him. Please take it easy on you. <laughs> because he likes to do evil. <laughs> and this guy confronted people with demonic powers again and again and again. And won so many victories. The book of his life story is titled A Tread Upon the Lion. This guy came into the midst of witchcraft but he was conscious of the presence of Christ. One day they had put a trap on, on his path so that when he comes out of his house the first step he will just take like this. He will just, just get his foot in, in, on, onto a, a trap. As soon as he stepped out when he was about to step that trap just untrapped itself. Bam! He just said thank you Jesus. Took it out of the way was taking the gospel to a small community one day when they got near the community and everybody saw uh, a, a particular line of, of skulls 
everybody ran away. All his associates took off and ran away. When he saw it, he just went on that. Because all the associates understood what it was. Whenever you see the line of skull, you cross the line, you die supernaturally. He looked at it and he just went on diet and passed. <laughs> when he sat down with the king of the village in his palace, the king began to tremble when he saw him. You made it? This must be supernatural. Sat down with the king. He said, won't you invite me to eat? But he ate with him. He said the food tasted horrible in his mouth. But he ate with the guy. Welcome, my sister. Pleasant surprise. <laughs> The food tasted horribly, but he ate it. There was one village he got to like that. After passing everything laid across the way for him to destroy him, all the villagers took off and ran away. You cannot be an ordinary human being. The guy must be a strange human being. They ran away. <laughs> to evangelize them was a problem. It was only the king he was able to evangelize at the end of the day and said, I'm going to come back. By the time he, he converted the king, of course, who was scared of him. By the time he came back, the whole village, it was a revival in the village. They planted a church there. Evangelical who couldn't speak in tongues. So what are we with Pentecostals doing? There's more to this thing than tongues. It's power. It's the manifest presence of Jesus. And we should be conscious of it. So when he said, he who believes in me, the works that I do shall he do, and greater works than this shall he do, because I go to my father. Because I go to my father. We see in John 16, 7, it's all about the comforter who will come. Because that comforter is the spirit of the father, is the spirit of Jesus himself. Wherever you see the comforter, don't ever forget, there may be three persons, but they are one at the end of the day. There are three that bear record in heaven, the father, the word, the spirit, and these three are one. And that's why, look at his words again. In John chapter 14. Oh, Lord have mercy. Glory to God. I must get into some things quickly before we are done today. So, he said, uh, again in the verse 19, a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. <laughs> so, today it's a oneness between us, Jesus, and his father. Is that not so? Um, skip down again. Uh, or let's look up a little. Let's look up a little. At um, verse 16. And I will pray the father. And he will give you another helper. That he may abide with you for how long? Forever. The spirit of truth whom the word cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you all ferns. I will come to you. Meaning, he was saying that when the comforter comes, I come. Is that very clear here? I'm not going to leave you. As often as I'm going to come to you. The comforter will, I'm leaving. The comforter will come. I won't leave you as often as I will come to you. Meaning that when the comforter comes, I come. You see, this time around, I'm a human being in one single body. I'm going to disappear now. I'm going to heaven. But when I come next time, I'm coming in spirit. Somebody say, Jesus is here. Say, Jesus is in me. Glory be to God. And that consciousness will always be there. No wonder in Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 it says, And whatsoever you do, do in the name of the Lord Jesus. Colossians 3 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. And to do it in his name. And he explained that in the course of doing it, in his name, I give thanks to the Father through him. In other words, every single thing I do in word or deed, I am to do through his strength and presence in me. You see, you've got to understand that this life is no longer mine. It's no longer yours. 
It's the Christ life. And we ought to live it in a consistent consciousness of his presence and power within us. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. Just to buttress this fact again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus. In other words, we reason and come to this, and we've come to this conclusion. That if one died for all, then all died. That's 15. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. It's no longer our lives. It's all about him now. And he is not weak, my brother. If you fall, it's an indictment. If you fail, it's an indictment. If everything remains ordinary, it's an indictment. If you remain in poverty, it's an indictment. The consciousness of his presence should be activated by you to trust him for total victory over sin, over sickness, over poverty, over failure, over demonic forces, and to take the life that you have and live it supernaturally for him. And as you live it supernaturally, you will discover everything accelerates around you. Because nothing can hold you down anymore. Nothing can hold you back anymore. So, the first thing here is believe. He who believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do. And greater works than this shall he do because I go to my Father. So, the Holy Spirit that is in me, the Spirit of Christ in me, is one that I shall have confidence in. And by my confidence in his presence and power, I'll be able to do the greater works. Now, I also want to point your attention to one more thing as I begin to round up now. He said, if I let me first make reference to verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. Can you see the connection between loving him and he's sending the comforter, the helper to the church. Let me show you a similar connection again. In verse 20. At that day, in other words, when he has gone to heaven and the comforter has come at that day. You see, because you need to listen to the words of Jesus and examine them all in their proper places. There were things he said within the context of the law. There were things he said in introducing the new covenant. And there are things he said as realities of after the Holy Spirit has come. Now he said at that day when the comforter has come, when he's already living inside you, you will know by revelation that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. You will come to that revelation knowledge of the oneness that you have with us. He now said in verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. He's talking about in the context of that day. It is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is another great key to the manifestation of the presence and the power of Jesus, apart from our faith in him and our consciousness of his indwelling presence. Now, if you understand the grace of God very well, you will know that according to 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. When we are really talking about the love of the Father, the love of the Father is truly revealed in the fact that he loved us first. Romans 5, 8, what God commended his love towards us in the while we were yet sinners, Christ 
died for us. Glory to God. First John 4 verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 10. First John 4 10. In this is love. In this is love. Not that we loved God. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Glory to God. So this is the beginning of love. He loved us. However, when you catch the revelation of his love for us, then what happens is we love him back because he loved us. There is a place for loving him back. Can I hear somebody say amen? Amen. We love him because he loved us. Okay, somebody may say that is John. How about Paul? You know, I have this extreme Paul people. Praise God. (laughs) Amen. Now, I believe very much that Paul is the most significant apostle of the church age. Why? Because according to Bible prophecy, we are in the time known as the time of the Gentiles. This is when the Gentiles are turning to God and the Jews are turning away from God. And even in Galatians 2, Paul talked about how that Peter and the other apostles perceived that as God had given Peter grace to the circumcision, that is to the Jews, as an apostle to the Jews, so had he also given him grace to the uncircumcision, that is to the Gentiles. And most of what you find as epistles are in the Bible, written by him in particular, were written to Gentile churches. And according to the flesh, you and I are Gentiles. We are not Jews. According to the flesh. But the Bible says we are Jews inwardly. By faith in Christ. So I don't like somebody calling me a Gentile today. <laughs> I don't like it. I was watching that there's this Jewish Messianic rabbi that I love very much watching his TV program. I was watching him not long ago and I was talking about the minister's conference where he ministered to the Jews and Gentiles. I, I just tuned to the channel away. What, what do you mean by that? I'm not going to like to watch it. Don't call us Gentiles anymore. <laughs> Glory be to God. But look at what Paul said in Romans 8 verse 28. I believe that you are very familiar. We all love Romans 8, 28. Yeah, but I hope we are conscious of uh, the conditionality there. It says that, and, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. To those who do what? Love God. Now, loving God does not have to take any strenuous effort on your part. Because it is not a product of works in the New Testament. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It's a fruit. It's not work. It's not self-effort. Because all it takes is you catching the revelation of his love for you. We love him because he loved us. So if you find your love for God lacking, don't put effort. Don't put any effort into it. It's not your strenuous effort. Turn your attention into the revelation of his love for you. Mm -hmm. And every time I go through the epistles and the great salvation has been expounded by Paul to the Romans, to the Galatians, to the Ephesians, to the Philippians, to the Colossians, it's all his love and manifestation towards me. No wonder Paul prayed in Ephesians 3 that you've been rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and breadth, the depth and height, and to know the love of Christ with perfect knowledge. When I focus on knowing his love for me, my love for him just overflows automatically as fruit because I'm drawing, I'm dipping my roots into his love. And I'm drawing my spiritual nourishment from his love for me. And the more I draw nourishment from his love for me, I bear the fruit of love. 
You understand that right now? So it's not a matter of strenuous effort. No, I'm going to show him I love him. I'm going to spend three hours with him every day from now. I'm going to read my Bible ten chapters at least every day. You are getting into legalism. You are getting into works. And you will soon get tired. I don't know about you, but I've failed in those kind of things many times. And I'm tired of failing. Right now, I have chosen the unreason. I mean, the, the unforced rhythms of God's grace. Oh, I love the way message translation puts Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. Hey, can you put message for me on the screen? Oh, now I have to rush. Glory to God. I'm trying to finish up and at the same time, I'm trying to take it as slow as I can for understanding. I've got a flight to catch, so I've got to finish up. Praise God. Do you guys have message translation? Thank you. So take it to Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Matthew 11, verse 28. Yeah. Jesus said, are you tired? Well, I, know, I know message is paraphrase. You know, but message gets it right uh, most of the time. A few times it doesn't get it right. So don't make message translation the only translation you read. <laughs> read the direct transliterations of the Bible like KJV, NKJV, NIV, NLT. They are from direct manuscripts, praise God. But this is one is so right. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, Jesus said, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. <laughs> Come on, let's read on. Let's read on. Walk with me and walk with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. <laughs> Meaning, if you understand this Christian life, it won't be a stress for you. Yeah, wow. yeah no. it, it won't be that difficult. You will even be doing things that are laborious and doing them with joy and with the grace of God. It's like Paul who said, I labored more abundantly than they are in 1 Corinthians 15. And then he said, Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. <laughs> That's why you say, I'm running all this itinerary. I got a flight to catch. I'm going to Maryland to preach this evening and I'm preaching tomorrow morning. And I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the journey. At times people talk about, how do you travel so much like that? And pastors, I mean, myself and, and, and uh, Pastor Dr. was sharing the other day and he was telling me how much he enjoys being in Dallas. And I told him how much I admire pastors a great deal. Just because the grace they have, I don't have. I cannot sit still. The evangelist in me cannot sit in one spot. I would die if I sit in one spot. <laughs> All that hopping on airplane to airplane, sleeping in strange places to strange places, hotel to hotel, eating strange food to strange food. It's fun. That's the way the Christian life ought to be. I remember how some people said they suspended traveling during COVID. The stress at the airport is too much. As too much as it was, I was flying. I was one of those people who still flew several times during COVID. I was in between Canada and Nigeria several times. I was planting a church in Vancouver. I had to put my mask on on a 10-hour flight at times. One time from Istanbul to Toronto, I had to put on that mask. And once in a while, I would lower it. <laughs> and then somebody comes and says, pull off your mask. Mm. But I did not stop me from flying. I still flew again and again and again. Somebody say, it's grace. The more the love of God is revealed to you, the more it flows out of you. But listen to me. Jesus said, uh, Glory to God. Let's go back to our text now. It's time to round up. Praise God. John chapter 14. <laughs> Look at the words of Jesus here in John chapter 14. Don't worry, I'll, I'll end up on this Romans 8, 28. Uh, but John chapter 14, it's the same thing there. It's, it's saying the same thing, really. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so the Lord Jesus said, uh, what will happen in this particular day Let's just skip down to verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, because Judas Iscariot in verse 22 said, I'm sorry, Judas, not Iscariot, <laughs> said to him, there was another Judas. Iscariot messed up their name. 
better not to share names with some folks, man. <laughs> Iscariot just messed up the name Judas. <laughs> Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not the world? How do you want to show yourself? And, and yet the world won't see you. And he, he said to him, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. He will be obedient. And my father will do what? Love them. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. If you want to see God's manifest presence rich in your life, then live a life of obedience to God. What it leads to is intimacy with God. Now, I, I know some, somebody may be having a little problem in your mind right now because you have a good revelation of the grace of God and you know God loves all of us unconditionally. Oh, yes, he does. Oh, yes, he does. But let me explain two different types of love for you. The Father loves everyone redemptively. This love is infinite. He told Israel, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's the kind of love with which the Father loves all of us. In Jeremiah 31 verse 3, he said, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. God was always drawing Israel with loving kindness because he loved and still loves Israel with an everlasting love. He so loved the world 2,000 years ago. He gave his only begotten son. He still loves the world today. But the love with which he loves the world is different from the one with which he loves his children. I know it is love. And he loves the world and loves his children. Everybody redemptively. Somebody say redemptively. Say it again. So why is he talking about if somebody kept my words, I'll love him again. And then we are going to make our home. Uh, what, what does he mean by that? It's the same thing in the book of Revelations where he told the church, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open unto me, I will come in and I will sup with him. Oh, I thought you were already on the inside of us. Oh, yes, but he's talking about a unique manifestation of his active, demonstrative, visible presence in the life of such people. If you want to carry this rich presence of God, then allow God to love you delightfully. Delightfully. All true and good parents love all their children equally. I don't understand this. I love one more than this other one. It's wrong. Just in case you don't know. It's wrong. We ought to love all our children equally. I have and I have made up our minds. Equal inheritance. That's what they all have. No one should ever feel that he loved the other one more than me. One time it looked like my son was feeling I probably loved his twin sister more than him. I just noticed a look on his face. Feeling I was being partial. And I was just being protective of that one because he was always bullying her. <laughs> but I didn't love him any lesser. But I was like, Victor, if he's not feeling as loved as a sister feels it, then you've got work to do to correct it. So I had to change my method of disciplining him in order for him to come to the comfort and the reassurance that he is as much loved as his sister was. He, he is an only son, so the tendency is even to be partial towards him. But I made up my mind the day he was born and his sister was born, uh, even though it was a boy we were looking for at the time, God sent us this precious gift. She would never have to feel for a minute that she is any lesser loved than her brother. But when I now notice it looked like the brother was feeling less loved, oh, the body is now mine to make sure he doesn't feel like that either. Are you following me, somebody? But let me give this example. We love all our children equally and one child is there, well-behaved, excelling at school, always doing the right things. And God forbid, none of our own children will be like that. The other one is on drugs. Do you hate the one on drugs? No. You stay your baby. You want him out of drugs. You will still love that one unconditionally. 
and redemptively. But are you excited about the lifestyle? No. You don't love them delightfully. God's everlasting love is always there. That's why no matter how far gone you are from God, his arms are open to receive you back. But if you really want his presence to be very rich on your, in your life, you want his active presence very rich in your life, then love him back so he can love you delightfully. Delightfully. And that's why he said, and we know, that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. To work together means, has nine meanings. It means to create and eliminate. To place and replace. Connect and group. Interrelate and intermingle. Shape and forge. Press and stretch. Move and operate. Control and guide. Arrange and influence. God will do all of this for your favorable outcome. And your life will be super, supernatural. You will succeed supernaturally. You will turn out supernaturally. Miracles, signs, and wonders will characterize your life. So, pastor of over 30 years, I can start giving you testimony after testimony, not just of miracle healings, but of the miracles that have taken place in the lives of church members. Just because they lived their lives of surrender to the Lord. Your life will be a stream of testimonies. And a ceaseless stream of testimonies and of miracles. As you operate in the manifest presence and power of God. God bless you. Rise to your feet. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all. We worship him. We worship. We worship you. You are worthy to be praised. In the name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, I stretch a hand of blessing over this congregation. And I declare every man and woman, every boy and girl under the sound of my voice, blessed. Blessed with a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. Energized and empowered for their purposes. We declare everyone entering into a great season of uncommon blessing and uncommon favor. Walking supernaturally in the love and the power of God. Walking in the consciousness of our Lord Jesus Christ and living their lives in total victory over sin, sickness, poverty, failure, Satan and his cohorts in the name of Jesus Christ. Declare everyone walking in dominion over the forces of this life in the name of Jesus. May your blessing rest upon King's word afresh and anew. May increase and expansion and enlargement on every front be their portion in the name of Jesus. We declare divine acceleration on the journey of purpose. We declare every church, every business, every career advancing with supernatural speed in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' name and somebody shouts the loudest. Amen. Amen.